Why is our show so sad? <laughs> it's not good. It's always sad. <laughs> it's always sad. How did I know. we get here? <laughs> this like <laughs> this phase of the show that we're going through right now, <laughs> like first quarter 2022, like I think much much less giggly. <laughs> <laughs> it's taking on what we've been feeling the last two years. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, listeners. This is our <laughs> this is the goth phase of our show. <laughs> I'm Paige. And I'm Megan. And this is Spooky Science Sisters. Hello, you're listening to Spooky Science Sisters, a podcast where we present to you a science-based and probably very giggly discussion on all things strange and unusual. In this episode, we are going to cover one of Megan's favorite topics, (laughs) volcanoes. (laughs) Yay! (laughs) And Megan is a real-life volcano expert, so I'm pretty much just going to sit back and learn about this with the rest of you. Yeah, this is just going to be me rapidly talking at Paige about volcanoes. (laughs) I'm excited about it. (laughs) All right. But before we get started on today's episode, we want to share some news with all of you. We are both super excited to announce that we are officially partnered with Evergreen Podcasts, a diverse network with shows for just about every interest. It has been really great to see how much our show has grown over the last two years. We are looking forward to continuing that growth with the help of the Evergreen team. Go to evergreenpodcasts.com to check out other shows like ours or to give something totally new a try. So before we get into volcanoes, we should do something spooky. So Paige, has anything spooky happened to you in the last week? The only thing spooky, I guess, that happened to me was that I found out that at the end of the year, I'm losing my job. (laughs) So that's (laughs) super exciting. So spooky. (laughs) What about you? Literally nothing. (laughs) My only thoughts going into this episode were volcanoes. (laughs) So... (laughs) I just took a drink of bubbly and then it came out my nose. (laughs) So, okay. We're just going to go. Let's do it. Because we should just do it. So, all right. To preface this a little bit, if there's one thing that I love talking about more than spooky stuff, supernatural stuff, it's volcanoes. (laughs) So... I am very tickled with myself that <laughs> I have A, convinced Paige to let me do this, but B, that I feel like I've figured out a way to capture spooky volcanoes <laughs> so that it actually works for this show. I'm also proud of it because I feel like <laughs> a lot of people think volcanoes and it's more like eh, terror, maybe like awe-inspiring, not necessarily spooky. But there will be some spookiness. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't usually love to toot my own horn, but I'm going to do it because <laughs> this is the one chance that I get to this do This is your it. opportunity to <laughs> this, this is my time. So I have been doing research on volcanoes since I was an undergrad, which... I thought about it and I was like, wow, I started 15 years ago. <laughs> you are so old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that little tidbit. <laughs> no, you dick. <laughs> um, that may be the only thing I say the rest of this episode. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I, you don't, you know, I don't have to tell you this page, but for the listeners, although I'm sure I've mentioned it before because I'm a nightmare, but I did my PhD on Crater Lake in Oregon using the chemistry of rocks that were erupted by the volcano there to tell us more about what was happening in the magma chamber during the buildup to the big eruption that formed the caldera that became what we know today as Crater Lake. So like large scale explosive eruptions are my jam. (laughs) (laughs) So I'm like super excited (laughs) to get to be the expert (laughs) for this show. (laughs) It was a real struggle narrowing down my notes for this. So there's an ungodly amount of them. And I was telling Paige before we started recording that 
like most of this is just like vomited out of my brain. <laughs> I was like, can I just put my brain as our source <laughs> for this episode? And I said, I think that that's fair. <laughs> you think that that's fair? <laughs> I'm going to go back and like find the sources that relate to this. But yeah, so it's volcanoes have been sort of my whole like research life. Now I'm more on the the analytical chemistry side of things, but it's definitely still a passion of mine. So I'm I'm pumped. I can't I can't say that enough. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I think the place to jump in and sort of the like classic when it comes to volcanic disasters and what I think most people think of first. And I was going to ask Paige, like, if that was the case for you, but is the eruption of Mount Vesuvius and its effects on the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum? Yeah, I mean, when we, you, when you told me that you wanted to do this episode, I figured that this would be a big part of that. Right. Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's where my head goes. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, I mean, that's like the classic. You, this is one of the first, I guess if you're talking like volcanoes, volcanic disasters, like that's the, in terms of impact on people, that's sort of like the one mm. <laughs> that you learn about uh, the most, at least in the American education system. <laughs> but I'm sure it's like that elsewhere as well. Okay, a little bit of background on this. So Mount Vesuvius, uh, this eruption... Uh, happened in 79 CE. I forgot to take any notes about the buildup to the big eruption, but <laughs> I just wrote buildup to big eruption. Yep. <laughs> Long story short, it had erupted before this, I think not in any substantial way to affect the cities that were established there at the point that we're at at 79 AD. And I think they they talk about there being some sort of like earthquakes and stuff leading up to this big eruption happening, but the people just like didn't really know what it meant. <laughs> so they were like, all right, whatever, this is a thing. This eruption happens in two phases. You start with sort of like the big initial explosion and this large vertical ash column that shoots up into the stratosphere. And you sort of get that like classic, you know, mushroom cloud looking mm -hmm. um, volcano as it starts to like spread out in the in the upper atmosphere. And we actually call this type of eruption a Plinian eruption. Um, and you will see now why this is later, which is some foreshadowing for you. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> but yeah, so this is like the classic explosive volcanic eruption that you see in pictures, like any paintings that people do of it. You see that big vertical ash column. You think the pictures of Mount St. Helens in 1981 with the big old ash column rising up into the stratosphere. So this stage of the eruption, people are freaking out from what we know from, <laughs> from eyewitness accounts. Uh, you get heavy ash fall on cities downwind during this stage of the eruption. So uh, you start to get collapsing roofs in Pompeii and, you know, people being killed or injured from debris related to that. And they start to obviously evacuate the city. How long does that like phase typically take? I could tell you. I want to say the eruption started like early afternoon, circa lunchtime. And then it was like not until that evening, like until the, in the night when the second phase kicks in. Gotcha. So I think it's like several hours. And this is pretty typical for like this type of volcano. That initial explosion has so much power behind it because like, you, you know, that's when you're you're taking the soda bottle cap off, right? And like mm -hmm. soda's just spraying out. In this case, it's <laughs> molten rock that's just being exploded out. And all that force is just directed upwards, right? So that's how you get this like that big classic ash column coming out of the volcano. Right. But as the eruption goes on, you start to a like sort of really like load the atmosphere with like all this dense ash because like it's it's 
glass like people think like it's not smoke or anything like that like it is tiny little pieces of (laughs) volcanic glass and as you lose a little bit of that power you start to basically get things like boiling over the sides almost like a pot boiling over and you start to see this collapse of the vertical column and you send pyroclastic flows down the slopes of the volcano in all directions. And this is the point in the notes where I noted, like, we might need a glossary for this episode. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. And so I had a question about that, though, because Mm -hmm. I thought there was, like, a difference between what was considered, like, a pyroclastic flow and just, like, I don't know, regular lava flow. Is there not? Is it the same thing? Like, is it synonymous? (laughs) Okay. Okay. Yeah. So lava flow is, like, liquid rock, right? It's... So it's magma under the surface. Once the magma is above the surface, we call it lava. In the case of lava, it's just, it's still liquid at the surface. Pyroclastic flows, on the other hand, are flows of ash and gas and rock pieces. So like clast is like, means piece. So like fire pieces basically is pyroclastic. Okay. Yeah. So those are, they're not liquid. They're, they're totally ash different. and, and okay. gas and, and chunks of like partially molten rock <laughs> that are, you know, going down the side of this volcano in these like huge clouds. The French term for them is nuée ardente, which just means glowing cloud. I got a burp. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Too excited. Drinking. <laughs> Too so yeah it's an explosive eruption so you're just like instantly expanding and fragmenting everything coming out of the volcano you've got broken pieces of the pre-existing rock that's been blown out of there and it's all getting tumbled together in this like horrible cloud of super hot super fast gas and other nasty stuff and ash that you, you know, don't want to hit you. (laughs) Still spraying in the air, essentially. I guess when I read that initially, I was thinking it was more like flowing, flowing, but it's not really. Yes. Yeah. Not like a lava flow. Yeah. We call them flows. People will also call them like pyroclastic density currents. And it's... (laughs) Yeah, there, there's whole things about like how the the whole areas of like volcano science about like the fluid dynamics and stuff of like how these flows move and distribute various materials. But that is like a whole PhD that we're not going to dive into right now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it is not a lava flow. <laughs> lava flow, liquid rock, pyroclastic, ash. Broken got apart it. rock. <laughs> got it. We got it. <laughs> yes. And I also saw that you noted, like, are they are they hotter or whatever? So technically the the lava flow form is going to be hotter just because like the pyroclastic flow is like broken apart and losing more heat to yeah. like the air that around it. But you're still talking about something that's like upwards of four hundred degrees Fahrenheit to like 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so it's still really like hotter hot. than what most people set their oven to. Right. <laughs> like rushing down at very fast <laughs> beans down the side of the volcano. So that's that sort of like second catastrophic stage. And you not only have these pyroclastic flows hit the city of Pompeii, you also have them hit cities on other sides of the mountain, like Herculaneum. So here's where we start to get to the spooky stuff. Most people associate the eruption with Pompeii, and they associate Pompeii with the casts of bodies that you can see there, which I am sure that you have seen pictures of, correct? Yeah, they're actually really cool. At Pompeii, and we will sh- I will share some photos that I took when I was there, uh, because yes, I'm going to brag that like I have been to both of these places. <laughs> and I, I was also a nightmare that day. Just like all the photos of me are just like extreme excitement. Like, <laughs> yeah, I was like Jake in like the episode where he gets to go to Nakatomi yeah. Plaza. <laughs> Take my picture with it. <laughs> Take my picture with it. Okay. <laughs> so the the bodies that you see there, a lot of people are like, oh, like, did they get like petrified or something? Or like, why, why were they preserved that way? So the skeletons are actually 
in there. And what you're seeing are actually plaster casts of the bodies. After these people died in this eruption, their bodies were buried in ash from both the ash fall that was happening, but also the pyroclastic flows that hit the city in the later stages of the eruption. And after some time, their soft tissues would have slowly rotted away, uh, leaving just their skeleton in a pocket of air. And the ash deposit around them lithified um, or hardened basically enough to not collapse uh, once their soft tissues were gone. And archaeologists... <laughs> started excavating the city and they came upon these like pockets right of like air basically within the within the ash deposits that smelled terrible oh, <laughs> like no. I mean, like this is like 2000 years later and they apparently still like smelled like death yeah. and which is crazy 2000 year old death yes <laughs> <laughs> so from that they figured out what was going on and decided to fill the, the um, air pockets with plaster and then remove the the ash around the plaster and what you're left with is this three-dimensional representation of the person and their body's final position that it was in so like to see them in person, it's like very profound because, yeah, I mean, you're 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 just seeing these rep representations of people in their like very last <laughs> moments of life, and I think some of it gets some of their positions and like the way they've positioned the bodies in the displays at Pompeii, like they sort of people will talk about like how someone was like reaching for somebody else or like there seemed to be these like very sort of purposeful positions. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of that is actually just like, you know, their muscles would have contracted into sort of like certain positions because of like heat shock essentially as they were buried. So some of that is like a little bit played up, I think for like the drama or the touristy side of it. Right. But yeah, but it's it's still pretty incredible. There are just some really powerful examples you can see of people who like probably were in the position that they died in, like sort of curled into that like fetal position. And you can see um, dogs where you can see like the collar that was around their neck. And it's crazy. So that's what most people associate Vesuvius with. And had you heard of Herculaneum before or were you familiar with it at all beyond um, like me talking I was gonna to, say talking only, at you only because it. of you <laughs> <laughs> yeah true I guess you, you you are because yeah because you've seen the photos <laughs> like hundreds of photos that I took when I was there so Herculaneum I like to talk about this because people are less familiar with it. It was discovered or rediscovered, I guess, later than Pompeii. Archaeologists started to uncover it. Uh, work was much slower because the ash deposits covering it are all from these pyroclastic flows, which are denser and thicker than what covered Pompeii. So it was harder to excavate and dig out the city. So this means that it happened later than Pompeii and more advanced archaeological techniques were available. You know, they sort of learned more about preservation and all of this and there was more effort put into preserving what's there. So it is much more remarkably preserved, a more well-preserved relative to Pompeii. But because this excavation was slower, initially when they were um, in the upper parts of the city, archaeologists believed that most of the residents of Herculaneum were able to, most if not all, were able to escape. It was a wealthier town. They figured that, you know, they had, and it was a seaside town. So they figured they had access to bo boats and they just like got out of there in time. Right. And my mom actually visited with her Latin class 
in the 1970s, which like, what the hell? Like 1970s middle schoolers get to go to Latin class and then go to Italy. But like, <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> um, we went to and the she- zoo. Right. (laughs) And she said that they had very little of the city uncovered at that point, and they hadn't found any bodies yet. (laughs) (laughs) Dun-dun-dun. That's my dramatic effect for this. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So, yeah. So Pompeii... It's super awesome to go there. It, obviously, I would never say skip it uh, because it's like the OG Vesuvius town. <laughs> and there's some super cool stuff there. It is a bigger city than Herculaneum. Pompeii, you could like very clearly see that so many of the walls and everything for the, the buildings that still exist were like built out of volcanic rock. And it's like you guys literally built your city out of the volcano that destroyed it, which is crazy. Uh, Herculaneum, on the other hand, though, is it's just so well preserved. And it honestly gives you like sort of a spooky vibe (laughs) when you walk around it because you just feel like people never left, you know, like everything's in such good shape that it doesn't look that different than walking around some of the existing like towns and villages in Italy where people live and work like you feel like people could just move back in and go about their business and you're walking around this you know this abandoned city that's like essentially a ghost town you know that like everyone died very suddenly in this very tragic event and you've got like the slopes of Mount Vesuvius like looming above you (laughs) so it's like It's just sort of a surreal feeling. And as you descend down into the city, you finally get to the boathouses. And it's in 1981 that archaeologists were able to uncover the boathouses below the main part of the city. And they make this gruesome discovery. So turns out that not everyone escaped. Mm. Uh, they opened up the boathouses to find that there were over 300 skeletons in them from people who had died from the pyroclastic flows who hit the city. So like they were clearly down there hiding and waiting to be rescued. And then the city got hit by, by the, the, the pyroclastic flows in the second stage of the eruption. It's like totally crazy to me that they didn't find it until 1981. Yeah. <laughs> That's insane. Off the top of my head, I would have to double check. I want to say that the city itself was rediscovered in the 1700s. I think somebody was digging a well and they were like, oh, hey, there's a whole city down here. Wow. (laughs) But I mean, like, that's like 700 years, I guess minimum of 700 years after the eruption happened. So, like, it was gone for a long time. Yeah. And, yeah, and like I said, like, there's, like, really dense, much harder deposits. So just harder to to scrape away, essentially. And like, they're still excavating Herculaneum. So like, you can walk into parts of the city where like, they're still digging it out from underneath, like the, the, the modern city of Urculano, like is just built on top of what, where Herculaneum used to be. So they find all these skeletons, and it is like, and you can go like you can go down to the boathouses and they've got this platform that you can walk out in front of them and you're like I mean you're feet away from just dozens of human skeletons sitting in these boathouses and they are so well preserved you know that you can still tell that like some of them were clutching each other and they've got their jewelry on and it's just it's just a surreal experience those people, like I said, were hiding. They would have been really quickly overwhelmed by the hot ash and gas racing down the slopes of the volcano. They estimate that the pyroclastic flows were moving at speeds of over 50 miles per hour. So too fast, obviously, for a human to outrun. And those are actually relatively slow ones compared to speeds that I've heard for some. And temperatures in the boathouses 
would have gotten to well above 400 degrees Fahrenheit. And some estimates have set up to like 900 degrees Fahrenheit. So the good news is (laughs) that people likely would have died very quickly. At worst, they suffocated, but I think even that would have been very fast. And if not, you know, they, they, it's, it's very likely that they would have died essentially instantly. So some evidence that we have for this being a very quick process is they've actually found uh, an example of a man's skeleton who his like brain got so hot so fast that it turned into glass, which is absurd. That is insane. Um, they've seen evidence that people's skulls like got also so hot so fast that like they i mean i think like their brains essentially started boiling and their skulls exploded so it is gruesome but they didn't suffer or like but they didn't yeah like it would have been minimal suffering (laughs) like they would have been they would have been gone very very quickly but like it is not a nice way to go like i am sure that it was an absolutely terrifying Oh, for sure. Experience. So there's obviously a, bi- a very big difference between the way that bodies were preserved at Pompeii, where, you know, yes, you get the skeletons and they were sort of like preserved in place, like in various locations around the city. And they were able to pump in the plaster to create this plaster uh, mold of them. And then scrape away the ash around it. So the bodies of Herculaneum were also buried in ash. Like pyroclastic flows are mainly ash, but again, much thicker. And um, since they're like rushing down the sides of the volcano, pyroclastic flows will also be hotter than just like ash fall falling downwind. So this means that within these thick deposits that have been created, it's going to be hotter and the people's soft tissue at Herculaneum would have gotten burned away by this heat. Unlike at Pompeii, where, you know, their soft tissue was just like able to slowly rot away. And as the, as the ash lithified around them, leaving that air pocket. So not only did these people like sort of get turned into like instant human brisket. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) <laughs> they had I mean I think they had they had no idea that they wouldn't be returning to their houses. So, you know, people had their belongings with them. They a lot of them had house keys, which like who knew that, you know, ancient Romans had house keys, but it turns out they've been around for a long time. But like they had their house keys, so like they expected to go back home once this was all over. Mm. You've got these skeletons in the boathouses. They've also excavated sort of like the former beach. The waterline has like receded. Um, so the the sh- actual shoreline or the ocean shoreline is uh, further out relative to where Herculaneum is today. But it would have been a seaside town at the time that this eruption happened. Okay. So there would have been a beach. They've excavated this former beach. They've found boats and they found additional skeletons on this ancient beach. And one of those skeletons that they found, which they just call skeleton 26 because they just number them. Um, they've known for a long time that this was a soldier, but newer evidence actually suggests that he was a high ranking one uh, and may have been part of the official rescue effort that was uh, going on. But like, it sort of makes it more terrible though. <laughs> Because his skeleton was found on the beach near a boat, suggesting that these people in the boathouses were like basically in the process of being rescued when the city got hit by all these pyroclastic flows, killing them and there would be rescuers. So it's not great. (laughs) Why is our show so sad? (laughs) It's not good. (laughs) It's always sad. <laughs> it's always sad. How did we get here? <laughs> this like <laughs> this phase of the show that we're going through right now, like first quarter 2022, like I think it, much, it's much less on. giggly. <laughs> 
it's taking on what we've been feeling the last two years. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry, listeners. This is our <laughs> this is the goth phase of our show. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a reason that we know so much about what happened at Herculaneum and Pompeii and why we can piece together, you know, these different, because there, there are some like much more recent eruptions that we don't have this detailed of a timeline in terms of like what the, um, the different phases of the eruption or like which cities got hit when, um, because dating of volcanic deposits just like cannot get you like to the day, to the hour, when these things happened. And there might have, you know, not been people in the area to provide um, these detailed accounts. But the guy named Pliny the Younger is watching this all play out across the bay in a town called Mycenaeum. Uh, He sees, you know, this initial eruption happen. And he uh, later records this in all of these detailed letters. And at this point, I think he's staying with his uncle, Pliny the Elder. Uh, Pliny the Elder actually dies uh, in one of these rescue missions in a city called Stabiae, which is not far from Pompeii, but across the bay from where Pliny the Younger was. Mm -hmm. Um, Pliny the Elder, also a super cool dude. He's a naval commander, but he's also an author and a naturalist and a natural philosopher. Some historians actually say that he wrote the first encyclopedia. Hmm. So that's pretty awesome. (laughs) Um, I think like there's, I've heard some things about him, like He's important in terms of like early medical history stuff. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, it's from Pliny the Younger's letters that we have this detailed timeline and it's where, which we're going back to the beginning here, he's who we name the style of eruption for. So we call this style of eruption a Plinian eruption. So it's what happened to Mount Vesuvius that day, but it's also what we would call um, what we would call sort of like the second phase of the Mount St. Helens eruption, for example, would be a Plinian eruption column. So from his letters, we know that it was dark for two days. So like these people probably thought this was like the end of the world. Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I would be thinking. Yeah. <laughs> because the eruption cloud blotted out the sun, even 18 miles away and uh, upwind where he was staying in Mycenaeum, they experienced ashfall as this eruption cloud is like mushroom clouding out uh, across the upper atmosphere. They felt blasts of wind that were pushed ahead of these pyroclastic flows that were burying Herculaneum across the bay. And Pliny, as well as many people in Mycenaeum, were afraid and feared for their lives there as well. Um, And so they were trying to flee the city. So one thing that I really love from Pliny's account is we have these dramatic passages from his letters that I think just do a really great job of capturing the terror that these people were experiencing and like what it was like to live through this whole experience, which is pretty amazing considering, again, this happened 2000 years ago. So Paige, I thought that I would have you read a few of these quotes from Pliny the Younger's letters. Yeah. Okay. So she, so you have three of them here and I'll just take a quick pause and move on to the next one. So We had earth tremors for days, which were not especially alarming because they happened so often in Campania. But that night, they were so violent that everything felt as if it were being shaken and turned over. I turned around and saw a thick black cloud advancing over the land behind us like a flood. Let us leave the road while we can still see, I said. We had hardly sat down to rest when the darkness spread over us. But it was not the darkness of a moonless or cloudy night, but it was just as if the lamps had been put out in a completely closed room. We could hear women shrieking, children crying, and men shouting. Some were calling for their parents, their children, or their wives, and trying to recognize them by their voices. Some people were so frightened of dying that they actually prayed for death. Many begged for the help of the gods, but even more imagined that there were no gods left and that the last eternal night had fallen on the world. It's heavy. That's, (laughs) yeah. 
so <laughs> so upsetting. I <laughs> glad that I like read through these before I had to read them because like uh-huh. here's the thing. I was definitely tearing up a bit when I read oh. it the first time. <laughs> I feel the same way. Like they're just these incredible records of yeah, what what people felt like and what I think that would mirror sort of like modern like obviously now we know that, you know, volcanoes are natural and they're not Yeah, sure, <laughs> they're but not like, like God's wrath raining down on us, but like But in yeah. a situation where something was happening that we didn't know, you know, mm-hmm. and then like mm-hmm. this is how we would all react. Exactly. <laughs> Once this eruption happens and the cities of Pompeii and Herculaneum get buried in ash, as well as other cities in the area uh, get buried and, and or destroyed. So there were some people that that returned to Pompeii to try to savage valuables and salvage valuables, not savage valuables. What the fuck did that mean? <laughs> I didn't even notice you said it. <laughs> um, but essentially both it and Herculaneum were completely abandoned. People didn't go back and try to reoccupy these cities. And Herculaneum would have been impossible because it was like literally buried. Completely. Right. But they got forgotten. And then it's like hundreds of years later that they are rediscovered. And the fact that that once they're rediscovered, people start to dig these old cities out. And especially at Herculaneum where they feel so well preserved. Mm -hmm. And then just like these terrifying accounts that we have of living through this experience from Pliny the Younger um, sort of segues us into the paranormal. Because to me, like one of the things that I love about these like big ancient volcanic eruptions is that it like it just feels <laughs> sort of like mythical or spiritual. Like like you said, like you I get <laughs> what people felt like like this is the end, right? Like, I'm not, the world is not coming back from this. So I was super surprised that when I you know searched around for ghost stories about Pompeii or Herculaneum, I didn't find anything. Yeah. Like- <laughs> and so I like didn't, not that I didn't believe you, but I was like, okay, yeah. I have to do this. I have to search myself yeah. too, you know? And like, <laughs> yeah, I, I found, which you'll talk about, but, like I found the same blog post yeah. you found and that's it. I mean, there's yeah. like, you know, the ghost of you know, whatever, like the, <laughs> they're, but they're not books about hauntings. They're just. Yeah. Yeah. Like you'll find articles that are like the ghosts of Pompeii, the ghosts of Herculaneum. Yeah. But they don't mean like paranormal, like ghosts formally live. They mean just like they're ghost towns right. or like they, right. you know, you, you, again, you get this sort of like eerie sense being there because it feels like in a lot of ways, like everybody just left. Like, aren't you coming back <laughs> to right. get your stuff? But yeah, yeah that was cool. all I found too. Yeah. The closest I got was a story about a woman who stole some artifacts from Pompeii and then mailed them back years later with a letter saying that she'd been cursed with bad luck ever since she took them. So she's sort of like asking for forgiveness for taking these. But that was like one woman's story. Like I didn't find sort of like a general thing about this. Right. Um, I found one blog where someone talks about using an EMF reader there, but like they didn't experience anything notable beyond they talk about like experiencing overwhelming sadness when they went into one of the buildings, but it's like, well, everyone feels sad there. So. I can't even talk about it without almost crying. So <laughs> Right. <laughs> Though she did mention, so I saw that blog and she did mention, I don't like towards the end that she took a picture and there were some orbs in it. Sure. <laughs> We've talked about those being BS several times, though. So <laughs> literally, like, if you've ever been around volcanic ash, like, it just, it's in the air. <laughs> it's everywhere. Like, that's all. And, like, also, it's tiny little microscopic glass pieces. Like, it's going to be shiny in a, photo- <laughs> in a picture. Stupid. Um, that's a dumb piece of evidence. Um <laughs> <laughs> but, shut down okay. shut down but like i'm i'm like a little bit bummed about it though because i seriously thought like i i was sure i was sure that i would look it up and someone would be like yeah i was walking to the city and like all of a sudden i 
turned and there was like someone dressed in like I could make up a story like there was well, someone dressed in like ancient Roman clothing and like I thought that they were a tour guide or like you know an actor doing something and then it was like then I turned around and they disappeared like I could write the ghost story for you right well I, that's what's shocking to me yeah is that like yeah. nobody's just made shit up about it I mean it's all made up anyway but <laughs> but you know or what I mean at least like made up by your brain that you just don't realize it right but <laughs> But like, I right? Like, I totally thought that I was going to find examples of that. And not at all. Nothing. And I, I thought like, maybe this is like, maybe it's like a cultural thing. Like maybe just like Italians don't, don't have as much belief in the paranormal relative to Americans or other countries. But it's like, there are other, plenty of other places that you could find in Italy that are supposedly haunted. So I don't know. It's sort of a weird thing. And I was like, I feel like this has to count as like solid evidence that ghosts just don't exist because like they if they do, there. like why wouldn't they be haunting these places? Right. <laughs> like this seems like a perfect setup for <laughs> ghosts. Like <laughs> men, women, children like on the verge of being rescued or like, you know, experiencing this very terrifying, this very terrifying way to die. And it's like, you're telling me nobody wanted to come back as a ghost? Like, well, then ghosts just don't exist. <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, that's exactly yeah. my thought too. <laughs> <laughs> there couldn't be a better setup. Yes. So anyway, I, I'm very sad that like beyond just sort of like terrifying accounts of how people died and how their bodies were preserved which like hey is spooky on its own i really thought that there would be some ghost stories to go along with this as well yeah so that's sort of like the most pompeii herculaneum sort of the most famous like when you think about the experiences of human beings in these like volcanic disasters. But obviously I feel like we cannot talk about um, spooky volcanoes without talking about scary big eruptions. <laughs> so, <laughs> so welcome to the existential dread portion of this episode, <laughs> which like you said earlier is like honestly becoming a theme lately. <laughs> Having a bad day. <laughs> this is gonna make it worse yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm th I it's not gonna make it worse you guys are gonna feel better uh, okay I have a good for I have a friend who listens to us and uh -huh. she like her biggest fear and I know you're gonna talk about it so I won't say much but her biggest fear is Yellowstone oh <laughs> Yeah, terrified. She's absolutely – she said that she, like, would love to move out west, but, like, uh -huh. she would never want to move close <laughs> because it scares her so much. <laughs> I I think this will make it better. <laughs> okay. I think it's going to make it better. Let's do it. Okay. <laughs> Unsurprisingly, big volcanoes and more specifically super volcanoes – are like the number one thing that I get asked about when I tell people that my PhD focused on volcanoes and like specifically that I did Crater Lake, which was created by a not super volcanic, but a large scale caldera forming eruption. And the term super volcano is like sort of funny to me because I feel like 15 years ago when I started all this and like, you know, was getting into the whole volcanic research world there was like all this talk about it, like sort of being like a buzz term and how some scientists didn't like it. And then I feel like at some point we just like gave up and we're just like, okay, fine. There's super volcanoes. <laughs> Cause it is sort of like, it's just a cheesy, like buzzword kind right. of term. But I think at some point we just gave up um, fighting against it. So <laughs> whatever. So like Paige said <laughs> in the U S which is most of our audience, but I guess like arguably a lot of people across the world as well know that, Yellowstone is not just geysers and hot springs and buffalo and all that. Uh, it is actually a giant volcano. <laughs> <laughs> so what is creating this volcano is what we call a hot spot. So it's actually just the same thing that is causing the volcanism at Hawaii, uh, except that rather than rather than the magma pooling beneath and passing up through very thin 
oceanic crust, uh, because Hawaii is a chain of islands in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the magma is pooling beneath and within very thick continental crust. So you get very basically just very different style of volcanism compared to Hawaii. Uh, But like Hawaii is a chain of islands, Yellowstone is part of a chain of calderas that actually stretch all the way into Idaho and Oregon and date back to at least 17 million years ago. Uh, Although newer evidence actually says that the hotspot may have been active as long as 50 million years ago, which is pretty awesome. But the whole idea here is that Earth's crust moves around sort of slides around on the mantle so like think back to like i don't know third grade science class and you learn like the layers of the earth the crust the mantle the outer core the inner core right the crust is like floating around on the mantle and this hot spot is based in the mantle so it stays stationary the crust moves over it and it essentially just like burns a track through it. Like if you were to like hold a candle beneath a piece of paper and move the piece of paper over the candle, you'd get a burn mark across the piece of paper. So in its current location, the Yellowstone hotspot has produced three what we would call super volcanic eruptions in the past 2.1 million years. The most recent of most recent of which happened about 640,000 years ago. So one thing that a lot of people like to call out is that these past three eruptions since 2.1 million years ago happened about like every 600,000 to 700,000 years. So the big thing that people like to say is like, well, it's been 600,000 years since the last one. So like it's quote unquote due for another eruption. And the answer to that is like, no, it's not. (laughs) (laughs) So like three past eruptions isn't enough to constitute a concrete enough pattern to say that something is due for an eruption. And that's just like not really a thing with volcanoes. And importantly, like there's a whole branch of the USGS volcano volcano observatory network that focuses on Yellowstone. So they're keeping an eye on it. There are literally no signs that it's like gearing up for anything. And most likely if there were to be some eruption there, it would be something small and not like this big catastrophic eruption. Of course, Yellowstone is the most famous, probably, but uh, it's not the only supervolcano in the United States. It is one of three active supervolcanoes, along with the Long Valley, (laughs) the Long Valley Caldera, which is in California, and the Valles Caldera, which is in New Mexico. The and the Valles Caldera, like, oh, it's so pretty. The area around that is just like amazing. Take my picture um, with it. Take my picture with it. Yeah, like literally, I go to New Mexico to visit my friend Allie, and I'm just the whole time. Take my picture with it anytime <laughs> I see volcanic rocks. I'm very excited about it. <laughs> and there are a bunch more around the world. There are also in the U.S. some really ancient extinct ones. There's like examples in Maine. There's examples in Missouri, various other places. So anyway, Yellowstone is not the only one. There are several. (laughs) And Paige is giving me a hard time in the notes because she's like, (laughs) don't worry, guys. Like Yellowstone isn't due to erupt again anytime soon. So I'm just going to give you a list of other super volcanoes in the U.S. you can start to worry about. <laughs> <It's> like... <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> it's not the only one. No, but yeah, I mean, here's the thing. Like, we would we would know something <laughs> yeah, was going to happen. Yeah, we would something other than <laughs> right. whatever Facebook post you guys see. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So like just like don't don't let yourself get stressed out about like clickbaity news articles that come out like yeah, about Yellowstone, about anywhere. Like just just chill. If it's not coming from the USGS, like just don't worry about it. So, I mean, there's a reason, right, that we that people are afraid of this and like a reason that your friend has a lot of fear about this is because these Big eruptions, these super volcanic eruptions can have global effects. So like obviously the effects in the immediate area around these volcanoes would be catastrophic. 
but I think it's been it's been bandied around a uh, bandied around a lot that a super volcanic eruption would like mean the end of humanity <laughs> as a whole. And that was like definitely a narrative that I was taught in the past. But here's the good news. <laughs> See, now we're getting to the good news page. Um <laughs> So ancient humans have actually survived two supervolcanic eruptions in the past. The first was the eruption of Mount Toba in Indonesia, which happened about 74,000 years ago. Scientists proposed that this eruption lowered global temperatures by three to three and a half degrees Celsius for several years and possibly triggered an ice age. So again, very significant global effects. And for a long time, people were saying, or scientists were saying, that Toba created this bottleneck effect where we see the genetic diversity of the human population shrinking down significantly. And that they proposed that it was possible that the human population shrank down to just 10,000 survivors, Um, which sounds like a lot, but like is low enough that for some time they were saying like we potentially got close enough to like humans not making it (laughs) after this eruption happened. I thought this was supposed to make us feel better. It is going to make you feel better. So this is called the (laughs) Toba catastrophe theory. However, this is the old theory about people not surviving. More recent research has contradicted the occurrence of a global volcanic winter and shown that human populations in India and Africa were actually thriving before and after the eruption. And newer genetic research indicates that the bottleneck may have just been the result of small, less diverse groups migrating into Europe and Asia. So like potentially some populations were heavily affected, but like there were big populations of humans just chilling and doing their thing through you know, through these colder temperatures, through whatever happened after the fact uh, in India and Africa. So there's one that we survived and we were fine. The second supervolcanic eruption that humanity has survived was at Taupo in New Zealand, which happened about 26,500 years ago. The geologic or I guess anthropologic record doesn't contain information on that eruption's impact on humanity, um, although it was large enough that global climate would have been affected. So, you know, I guess like maybe it's a good thing that we don't see any evidence for us experiencing or necessarily experiencing much much hardship to survive during those times because we obviously survived (laughs) this eruption. And just to point out, so the Toba eruption was larger than the largest eruption that has ever that Yellowstone has ever produced, which is the one that happened just over 2 million years ago. And then Taupo in New Zealand was larger than the most recent eruption at Yellowstone. So the one that happened a little over 600,000 years ago. So these are very large eruptions that humanity has been around for at least like, you know, our predecessors have been around for and we made it. Yay for us. We did it. Um, (laughs) Yes. So this is sort of like the feel good message of this is like, yes, like you would have very severe effects from an eruption like this because there would be direct effects like in the immediate area. There would potentially be indirect effects from climate changing after the fact from like food shortages, etc. So like, it might not be a great time (laughs) afterwards. But like, I guess I like to think, you know, people are pretty resourceful, like we would figure it out. Although, admittedly, you'd think we would have all banded together the last couple years. And that doesn't seem to have happened. (laughs) So So maybe we're back to being depressed. Um, (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and so we obviously don't have any like written records of what happened 74,000 years ago or 26,000 years ago for these super volcanic eruptions. But we do have um, examples of what humanity experienced with more more recent eruptions that are basically like an order of magnitude smaller than what we would consider a super volcanic eruption, but we're still very large eruptions in their own right. So a couple of examples are also volcanoes in Indonesia. 
So Indonesia is like one of those places that I might be like, mm, maybe I don't want to live here because there are very large volcanoes <laughs> that have produced very large eruptions in the past. <laughs> um, so I guess if you're going to be afraid to live in a place because of a volcano, that, that might be, the, be place. the place that I, <laughs> that I would not, that I would maybe choose not to live in because of the hazards. But a couple examples are the eruption at Mount Tambora in 1815 and Krakatoa in 1883. So again, both of these are in Indonesia. The initial explosion at Krakatoa produced the loudest sound ever heard on Earth at about 180 decibels. Um, Holy so moly. Some, yes. So some other events have been louder but like there aren't reports of them being heard at least by human ears but this is loud enough that it was heard 3000 miles away that's <laughs> which crazy is bananas the explosion was equivalent to 200 megatons of TNT or about 13,000 little boy atomic bombs, which is the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima, um, exploding simultaneously. <laughs> so, yeah. So, again, like, volcanoes are just like, it's just like this incredible raw power that is super cool, but also really just scary. sort of scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just like an enormous amount of energy. Mount Tambora, on the other hand, is associated with the what we call the year without a summer. So it erupted in April of 1815. That initial part of the eruption, because it was also associated with a massive tsunami, resulted in the deaths of more than 70,000 people. So that's terrible uh, on its own. Uh, this is the largest known and deadliest explosive eruption in recorded history. It lowered global temperatures by about one to three degrees Celsius, uh, which doesn't sound like a lot, but you have to remember that like that's an average of global temperatures. So like some places got much, much colder. Uh, so for example, it was very cold and rainy across Europe and North America all summer. You had crop failure, death of livestock, and famine. Uh, in New England, there are reports that there was heavy snowfall in June and freezing temperatures in July. So, Oof. like, basically, they just lost a summer. That's, like, my personal hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> <laughs> but... The, I guess, spooky tie-in here is that a young woman by the name of Mary Godwin was spending the summer with her future husband, Percy Shelley, and their friend, Lord Byron, and this dark, dreary weather helped inspire her to write the classic horror novel, Frankenstein. Ooh, you have done <laughs> a really good job of tying in spooky stuff. <laughs> I'm so I'm proud very, of you. <laughs> very proud. <laughs> but like, who would have known? Sort of like the, one of the original horror, horror stories. We partially have to thank a volcano for it. So, yay. <laughs> and you guys were not going to get out of this without me talking at least a little smidge about Crater Lake. <laughs> <laughs> I because was wondering it, what it was. Duh, it's going to happen. Okay. So Crater Lake is an example of, you know, similar similar in size to Tambora and Krakatoa. So one of these like large scale, but not, not large enough to be a super volcanic eruption. But it's called air forming eruption. It happened about 7,700 years ago. There were indigenous people in the area that had been living there, I think, I think since about 11,000 years ago, but I think newer research suggests that it was even longer. But I just think like, again, it's one of the examples or one of these, one of these examples where it's super cool because you get the perspective of people who experienced it as it was happening. Mm -hmm. And what we get are these oral histories that were passed down uh, by indigenous people since this eruption happened. And so one of these stories says that the mountain, which was Mount Mazama before it collapsed in on itself and became Crater Lake, uh, was the entrance to the below world or essentially like hell or the underworld. And uh, the home of its chief 
Lao. This story tells of a great battle between Lao and Skell. So Skell was the chief of the above world uh, who came down on top of a of Mount Shasta, which is another cascade volcano, to defend the various uh, native tribes in the area. And so these two gods throw rock and fire at one another, and Lao is eventually defeated and cast back down into the mountain, which collapsed around him and buried him. And it's like th- they're describing the eruption. Yeah. <laughs> like they would have seen the Crater Lake eruption happen, they would have seen Mount Shasta erupt as well. And I just think that's so cool because, again, I'm sure this was like a very significant event for them. And like Crater Lake is like an order of magnitude larger than what happened at Mount Vesuvius. So again, you're, I mean, these people were probably terrified. I think it's just really cool that there's this whole mythology that exists around it. It is cool. Yeah. And to this day, the lake remains sacred to Native people, some of whom still refuse to look upon the water believing that it could lead to their death. So there's basically sort of like a curse associated with the lake. And unlike Herculaneum and and Pompeii, where you think there'd be all sorts of ghost stories, there's actually like a bunch about Crater Lake. (laughs) Yeah, that that doesn't surprise me. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. I mean, there's a bunch from like phantom, phantom fires, like showing up on the island in the middle of the lake. And like the rangers take a boat out to check it out because they assume that like somebody stayed behind after one of the boat tours stopped there and then like they get out there and the fire is gone and and no one's there and yeah there's several other examples it sounds like maybe we can do an entire we could do crater lake a, a million episodes on volcanoes <laughs> i've this isn't even so many i had so many ideas written down page <laughs> well i for one am grateful because i i feel like i learned a lot today <laughs> good you didn't just feel like I just like excitedly vomited information on you no, for it was fun. an hour and 20 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, I very much appreciate you indulging me and all of our listeners indulging me <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I I just really love volcanoes and I think there's a lot of cool there's just a lot of cool science obviously out there, but I think the the human tie-ins and what people have experienced is like it's what makes it it's what makes it spooky. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was great. And the existential dread. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really we should add that in our uh show notes. Our uh <laughs> <laughs> come, come for the giggles, stay for the, stay existential, for the existential dread. dread. <laughs> That's our new tagline. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) All right. Well, that wraps up our episode on spooky volcanoes. Tune in for episode 44, Short and Spooky Tokyo Drift. If you liked this episode, hit subscribe and share with a friend. You can find us on TikTok at Spooky Science, Twitter and Instagram at Spooky SciPod, Facebook at Spooky Science Sisters, and at our website, SpookyScienceSisters.com. If you have any questions about previous topics or ideas for future episodes, email us at SpookyScienceSisters at gmail.com. As always, thank you for listening and stay spooky.